Thank you for joining Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our 2019 Webinar Wednesday series. We are coming to you live from downtown Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday, and you can find the upcoming schedule on our website. Past webinars and all recordings are also on our website and on our YouTube channel, along with over 160 other recordings on federal contracting topics. All are complimentary. If you have questions for a speaker today, you can email her directly with the information you'll see on the last slide. Right, just a little bit about us. We are a Washington, D.C. based firm. We are a Washington, D.C. based firm and provide services for federal contractors. This ranges from market analysis reports to proposal writing and also post award to clients. More information is on our website, so please visit us. And these are a few upcoming events that you can find more information here or also on our website. And we now offer advertising, so you can email me if you would like more information. And our webinar today is sponsored by AccuTrack, and here's a short message from them. AccuTrack Consulting and Accounting Services is an 8A WOSB CPA firm committed to supporting entities sustain growth in government contracting. Our outstanding DCAA accounting solutions reduce audit risk, improve cash flows, and give you peace of mind. Contact us today to learn how we can enhance your DCAA accounting efforts. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Johanna Reed. Um, thank you for joining us today. We're going to be covering cybersecurity under the FAR. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Jody. Thank you, and good afternoon. Um, if we go to the next slide. So, unclassified, and keep in mind, there's a lot more money out there. Uh, with classified cyber spending, but you can see the growth that has occurred since 2014, and in fact, it's almost, um, it's over doubled. Um, and the values are in billions of dollars, and there's a real need to be paying more attention to cybersecurity. The FY 2020 budget has a request for $17.4 billion, and that is for all cyber spending, including for classified, for both defense and civilian agencies, and compare it, contrast that to the 2019 request, which was for only $15.1 billion. Next slide. So, first of all, what is cybersecurity? The National Institutes of Standards and Technology defines it as the ability, excuse me, to protect or defend the use of cyberspace from cyber attacks. Next slide. According to the latest 2018 GAO report, there were 35,277 total information security incidents across all of U.S. government um, agencies that, by the way, were reported to the Department of uh, Homeland Security, U.S. Computer Emergency Readiness Team, which is called CERT for FY 2017. Think about that number there. 35 thousand that are reported. Not all of them are reported. Um, so where do these threats come from? They're coming primarily from web-based applications, loss or theft of equipment, email phishing, improper usage, and other attack methods that don't fit within those categories. And if you really want to read a lot about cybersecurity, I can tell you that this December 2018 GAA report is a very, very interesting report, and it's a fairly extensive report in describing um, cyber incidents and so forth in with the agencies. And if you're interested, it is at GAO-19-105, and it's entitled Information Security, Agency Needs to Improve Implementation of Federal Approach to Securing Systems and Protecting Against Intrusion. Next slide. So what are the laws that govern cybersecurity? Once again, we don't have just one law. We have a bunch of them. And most of them, at least the ones on this page, are either intertwined or simply not being followed by the agencies. So you have FISMA, which we'll talk about in the DOD um, presentation later, the Federal Cybersecurity Enhancement Act of 2015, Executive Order 13. 800, which is strengthening the cybersecurity of federal networks and critical infrastructure. Then you have 32 CFR paragraph 2002 dealing with controlled unclassified information. So FISMA imposes the basic information security requirements upon federal agencies and many contractors. 
It's been fleshed out in much greater detail by policies and standards issued by the Office of Management and Budget and by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. The agencies, even though this applies to them, are way behind in compliance. In the end, the executive order here led to the issuance of 32 CFR Section 2002. Next slide. So what are the FAR clauses? Basically, you have general policies regarding the purchase of information technology at FAR 39101. You've got privacy safeguards that were put in place as of August of 1996. You have 4.19, which is the safeguarding of covered contract information systems, which, by the way, while that term is defined, I will tell you, you could ask the average contracting officer and they could not tell you whether the contracts that they are issued contained covered contractor information system, covered contractor information or not. And unfortunately, this is one area where at least from a training perspective, the government is woefully lacking. There's FAR 52.204.21, which is the clause that gets put into your contracts. OMB Circular A130, and OMB Circular A130 is actually incorporated into the FAR uh, pursuant to 20421. And then, of course, there's, there's two DFARS clauses, which we'll talk about in the second session today. Next slide. So, the next couple of slides, I'm going to actually give you the text of the FAR clauses, because I think they're important. Um, but I won't probably read the text because I'm presuming everyone else can read them and we'll leave them up long enough for you to read them. But one of the important things about this is that it says that agencies shall identify their requirements. I will tell you experience has shown that that identification is not happening. Again, partially because they're not entirely certain what they should be including and partially because it's a new way of doing things, and the FAR hasn't really, the language is in the FAR, but how that's to be implemented really hasn't come out in a lot of the different agencies. And as I just said earlier, OMB Circular A130 is incorporated into FAR 39.101. And the big thing that they're looking at here is they're trying to protect the privacy, national security, emergency, pre emergency preparedness, and accommodations for individuals with disabilities and energy efficiency. As you can see, those are widely divergent goals. Um, it's very, very different to try and protect privacy and national security versus having accommodations with disabilities. And yet, it's all in OMB Circular A130, which is simply incorporated by reference in FAR 39-101. Next slide. Once again, here, it's agencies shall include the appropriate information technology security policies and requirements, including those that come from NIST. Well, we don't have a workforce right now that knows what to include, and it's a recognized issue. Um, I was at a cybersecurity conference last fall, and one of the things that I, I learned, which I was very, I was very pleased about this, is that they're looking at making cybersecurity professionals not be considered part of the standard um, government pay scale. And the reason for that is because if you come out with a cybersecurity degree from a halfway decent school, you're going to be coming out out of college. By the way, if you have any kids, send this, them this information at either the upper uh, 90K range or even up to 100 plus K range as your salary. And the government system simply can't pay those. So they're not getting the number of employees that they need. There's also been a lot of issues with simply opening up the government workforce to hire enough people to meet these requirements. And ultimately it's up to the contracting officer who, as I've already mentioned, has not been adequately trained and it's recognized by them and too much of their frustration, quite honestly to make sure that the appropriate standards are included in the contract. And finally, 
when you require information technology as an internet protocol, um, and by the way, Interpret Protocol is a communications protocol that provides the identification and location system for computer on networks and routes traffic across the internet. So many of you have probably seen like something that says an IP address, and you've seen nothing else, you've seen it in movies where they talk about an IP address and it was um, three digits, point, three digits, point, three digits, point, three digits, point, so a total of 12. Well, that was actually based more on Internet Protocol 1. We're now up to IPv6, which is the current, most current level of that. And again, I've been dealing with cybersecurity for quite some time. And as a practitioner, and until I started actually doing a lot of training in this area, I will tell you, looking at putting in a requirement into a contract to indicate what I, internet protocol level something has to be was simply not something I would have looked at. Now, the government has, has some, helps you a little bit here in that they have some websites where they take, where you have to get, if you're trying to sell to the government, you have to get approvals and your internet protocol is actually looked at and tested. And you can actually go in and test your own equipment um, through some uh, public agency um, websites and through some companies. And as always, as always, there are companies that are happy to do this for you. Next slide. So what are the privacy and security safeguards? Well, the first thing is, is that without the government's permission, you're not supposed to publish the details um, of any safeguards. Now, what's interesting and almost ironic about this is when some of the early regulations came out from Congress regarding um, the security and how you protect stuff, they had a requirement that agencies had to report to the government, um, to Congress, as a matter of fact, um, how what methods they were using to protect their information. Now, a little known fact is much of what goes to Congress is considered public information. And the same kinds of things that um, if, if you were an agency, you have to protect, the government doesn't, the, the Congress doesn't protect it in the same manner. So basically, you were publicly putting out exactly how an agency was protecting its, stuff, its information. Um, somebody brightly got the conclusion that maybe that wasn't the brightest thing in the world to do. And as a result, they ended up changing it. So now it gets reported to the Department of Homeland Security into the, and the Homeland Security then does a top level uh, briefing to Congress on how the various agencies are given their protection. Next slide. Um, the agencies are supposed to have a program of inspection to safeguard against threats and hazards. Um, I am not aware of any program that's officially out there. I do know that in DOD, some DCMA offices have done some of these reviews, but quite frankly, this is, this is another area that it has just not actually been um, implemented very well. And much like in paragraph C, if you have new or unanticipated threats, um, they're supposed to bring the situation to the attention of the other party. I'm going to take a guess that the contractors do a much better job of telling the government when they discover them than if than the con government does with their contractors. And again, a lot of this has to do with training on both the government side and the contractor side. Next slide. So where are the gaps? Implementation, we've already talked about that. It's not being implemented. Um, security management, um, on the civilian side, even in the Department of, Ho of Homeland Security, where a lot of these, where a lot, where a lot of the stuff is supposed to come from, so to speak, um, it's just not there. Um, the Federal Information Processing Standards, the NIST guidelines, don't apply to subcontractors. In fact, all of the stuff in the far side of the house is not necessarily flowed down to subcontractors. So when we talk about NIST guidelines, what NIST guidelines are we talking about? We have the cybersecurity framework, 
We have a risk management guide for information technology systems. We have a guide for applying the risk management framework to the federal information systems. Um, next slide. 53 deals with security and privacy controls for federal information systems and organization. And then 800-171, which is the one that you hear about the most, is protecting controlled unclassified information in non-federal information systems organizations. So this is the one here that is very, very specifically applied to contractors. So if you have a solicitation that requires compliance with a certain NIST standard, or that indicates more credit will be given for a higher, higher cyber protection. There's been a couple of protests at the GAO, and the GAO has supported the contract, the, the government's position on this. And as a result, we now know that if you have a cybersecurity framework and you are also using the Risk Management Guide for Information Technology Systems, for one, that is two distinct things, and two, when you're compliant, and that's one of the pluses, so to speak, in the evaluation criteria, you're entitled to that plus. And if an unhappy, unhappy contractor protests that because they didn't win, the GAO will deny the protest. So this is one area where it's getting very, very clear that with regard to cybersecurity, the GAO is definitely fully on board. Next slide. Um, FAR Part 1901 is the definitions, and these definitions are very, very critical to understanding what's going on. And the one I want to point out the most is federal contract information. Basically, it's information that's not intended for public release that is provided by or generated for the government under a contract, and I apologize, there's a double line here, to develop or deliver a product or service to the government but not including information provided by the government to the public, such as, next slide, websites or simple transactional information, such as that necessary to process payment. I will, again, it's very confusing what's included. So if you are a commercial vendor and you are doing some software for the government, what do you include there? What do you not include there? Next slide. Also is also critical is what's applicable. That this clause is not, the clauses are not applicable to everybody. If you do work for DHS or any other agency and you're not dealing with the FCI, you don't have to be compliant. Commercial office self equipment does not have to be compliant. Next slide. This is the clause that's actually and the meat of what is passed out on the FAR. But again, if you are not handling the appropriate information and the government has to tell you what it is, you don't have to be compliant. This clause identifies 15 security requirements for safeguarding. Uh, they are, they do mirror the NIST SP-800-171, but they are slightly different. First thing is you have to limit your system access to authorized users. Seems kind of um, obvious. Two, next slide. Limit the system access to the types of the transactions that our authorized users are permitted to execute. Verify and limit control connections. Control the information that you that you have that is put out on publicly available systems. Identify the information system users. Authentication, this is a big thing. You hear a lot about two-factor two, uh, authentication. This is also what they're talking about. Next slide. You need to destroy the information. You need to limit the physical access and es escort your visitors. You need to monitor, control, and protect organizational co communications. That's your internal ones, that they stay within the organization. Next slide. You need to provide protection from malicious code. You need to update these protections when it comes out with updates. And finally, you need to perform periodic scans. Next slide. This is kind of the catch-all 
that basically says you still have to handle controlled unclassified information as established by Executive Order 13556. But it doesn't give you how to do this. And finally, note, there is no requirement to report a cyber incident. So when we talked about that 37,000 incidents at the very beginning of today's presentation, please note, you don't have, the agencies don't actually have to report them. Last slide. Next slide. So when can you expect the FAR clause to implement CUI program? Soon. However, we've been hearing it's going to be soon for over the last two years. This is what's currently up there for um, the FAR case. And there are no other FAR cases for implementing any other cybersecurity. Next slide. This concludes the FAR presentation, and I hope many of you will join us at the DFAR section where we'll talk about these other things um, this afternoon. Last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and insight today. Today's presentation has been recorded and can be found on our website or YouTube channel within about 48 hours. If you have questions about today's topic, please contact Jody at the phone number or email address shown on your screen. Thank you, everybody. This concludes the webinar.